question. I hope for those of you in the room, the curd rice was good. Was it good? Okay, that means it was really, really good. So I have 20 minutes and what I'm basically going to walk you through is, is this whole notion of making the web a whole lot more beautiful than it is right now. And along the way, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of products, uh, particularly Internet Explorer 9 uh, that we've had the pleasure of launching uh, about four weeks ago. Uh, we also had a lot of local partners in India who came forward and adopted uh, some of the new things uh, that IE9 enabled for them to offer to their consumers. That's one of the thing, and then I have a little surprise at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the session, uh, that I'm also going to talk to you about. So without much further ado, that's the agenda. Uh, I'll start off by talking to you about what we, uh, what we refer to as native HTML5. Uh, and again, you know, for those of you who've been uh, native programmers and have graduated to being web developers, you realize uh, native development gets you as close to the metal as possible. Uh, you can extract the last ounce of performance, be it on graphics, be it on computation, uh, which has been somewhat you know, hard to do uh, in the web world. And the web sort of continues to, well, web developers or web development in general is look, looked upon as, as this you know, almost there but not yet there kind of thing. That's something that I want to talk to you about. Uh, the, the second thing that I want to talk to you about is, uh, is certain patterns that, that we followed uh, in the development of IE9. And, and that's also a part of a forward-looking promise in terms of things that we will continue as we move along uh, in the next version of our browser. Those are the three main things uh, that I'll talk to you about. So let's start by understanding what is this native HTML5. So today, if you look at it, web development has primarily been about HTML markup, about using JavaScript, and by using a bunch of you know, uh, CSS to mark things up. Now, what I'll do is just switch over to my desktop and call your attention to, to my address bar, uh, to, to my task bar. I hope all of you can view this right at the back. I've got a bunch of apps. Uh, I've got Internet Explorer. Uh, I've got Chrome 11. I've got Firefox 4. And alongside, those are all typical native applications which have uh, access to all the processing power that's on the PC, be it multiple cores, uh, be it GPU, be it the ability to allocate you know, as much RAM as it required, and so on and so forth. Right? What you see next to that is, is the small little birdie. Right? Uh, most of us are familiar with that, I would presume, uh, Twitter. So what you're seeing here is we've act I've actually pinned Twitter as an application on my taskbar. So not only that, I can also right click and I get a quick jump list of things that I do most often with, uh, with Twitter. So the whole notion is websites that were contained to running within the frame of a browser are now installed as applications on your machine. And you have the same you know, experience of running uh, a native app as a website. So, so let me zoom out. I'm going to go ahead and say search. Takes me to the search interface on Twitter. Again, I'm going to keep zoomed in to make this easier. I can go ahead and search for Gits. Zoom out and I basically get to see a lot of uh, tweets that are happening on Gits. And that's just one capability of being able to pin sites as applications to the taskbar. And again, uh, there, is, there is data to back up the fact that applications that are pinned to the user's taskbar the users tend to go back to them a whole lot more often. So if you're running Windows 7 and if you've got Internet Explorer 9, go try pinning these sites. Try pinning Facebook, try pinning Twitter, uh, try pinning you know, any of your favorite Indian sites, be it India Times, NDTV, Read of Song Buzz, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you would basically be able to get access to the sites a whole lot quicker. We also have data to prove, uh, again, from, from local sites as well as international sites, that sites that are pinned on the user's taskbar tend to get 50% more attention from the user which is essentially what the web is about. It's about making sure you have maximum time from the user on your website, right? And that you can monetize through, you know, commerce transactions or advertising and so on and so forth. But it gets a little better if you look at an application like Facebook. And you will notice, not only do I have access to my favorite, you know, Facebook messages, Facebook wall and so on, I even get a small notification which tells me that, hey, there is something waiting for you on Facebook. So let me go ahead and, you know, start Facebook, zoom out, and sure enough, you know, there are messages and there are, you know, interesting things that I should probably go look up. Again, this is Facebook as it is. I can uh, unpin this application. Uh, I can close Facebook and I can start this all over again. So let's go back to facebook.com. Uh, I have my auto login set up. All I need to do is just drag drop Facebook from, uh, from the, you know, tab uh, all the way onto my taskbar. I can place that right over there. And sure enough, you not only have 
Internet Explorer, uh, which is a very, very minimalistic browser. Uh, so you don't have any, any artifacts, any add-ons, and any of those other things coming in the way. It's a very minimalistic browser. The browser now looks and feels like Facebook. You have the Facebook icon here, just like in any other you know, Windows application. Uh, the back buttons, front buttons, they take on the look and feel uh, of, the, of the website's color. Uh, you can obviously change that. And that's kind of how it works you know, across, across websites. That's one notion of being able to take a website and make it behave like an application. But it gets, gets even better. So let me show you, you know, an interesting game called Pac-Man. And uh, this is an HTML5 based game. Uh, it's obviously fairly simple to build uh, compared to some of the other higher end graphic things that I'm going to show you. So there is some third party content on the website. I'm just going to go and say show all. Now this is the world's biggest Pac-Man. Uh, now for those of us who grew up playing Pac-Man, it's basically a single, you know, uh, a boundary within which you play games. In this one, all of these different Pac-Man games, they're all connected. So let me pick one. So let's say I'll pick this one. Uh, and this is going to go ahead and start playing. And I need audio here. Okay. So the audio is disconnected. Otherwise, you would see the familiar Pac-Man gameplay out. What has happened here is you basically go off on, from one Pac-Man world to the other Pac-Man world. And again, this is all, you know, HTML5 done entirely within the browser. And again, if I, if I were not telling you that, you know, it's kind of impossible to tell because uh, what takes the attention of the user, for all of you who are looking at this demo on screen, uh, you probably don't see the window. You, you probably don't see the browser at all. The browser is really, really minimalistic because the focus is entirely on the site. Uh, and with IE9, uh, we, we basically call that out explicitly. The purpose of the browser is not the browser itself is to make the websites, the underlying websites, make them look beautiful, make them a whole lot more enriching, make the experience a whole lot more enriching. That's the biggest, you know, uh, theme as far as Internet Explorer 9 is concerned. So that's one aspect of, you know, HTML5 and being able to build all kinds of unique, interesting games, uh, you know, make it a lot more engaging for the user. Now let me sort of move forward a little bit, talk about certain other slightly higher end graphical capabilities that are available inside of IE9. Now, as many of you might know, uh, Internet Explorer 9 runs on Windows 7 and Windows Vista. Uh, we do not run, run on Windows XP. What that allows IE9 to do is leverage the full power of the, pro of the, of the computer. Uh, we, we call this not just running on top of the operating system, we call this running all the way through the operating system. So if you look at the hardware capabilities that are, that are there on the machine, uh, be it a GPU, be it multiple, you know, CPU processing cores, all of those are leveraged with IE9. Again, we have telemetry data, which tells us that all machines running Windows 7 and Windows Vista, on an average, have about two and a half cores. Uh, that's across all the machines running Windows Vista and Windows 7 that are, you know, getting service packs and updates from, from Microsoft. So it would obviously not be good to build a browser that leverages only one core, which is what some of the other browsers do. What happens with IE9 is if you have a lot of JavaScript, we basically start executing the JavaScript through an interpretation engine on the first core, but we essentially download all the other higher end JavaScript compilation activity on the second core. So we are talking about, and this might sound silly, we are talking about a browser that scales across multiple cores. Right? Now, again, for most of us who have been in the industry, scalability is not something that you associate with, you know, with a browser. But clearly, as the web gets more and more you know, graphically rich, more and more intensive, it's entirely reasonable to expect the browser to be as scalable as the developer wants it to be. That's one aspect, you know, scaling across multiple cores. The second is this ability to use the GPU. Now again, you know, uh, there's been a lot of going back and forth between NVIDIA, one of the GPU manufacturers, and, and Intel. You know, NVIDIA claims that the GPU is 100 times faster than the CPU. I Intel obviously says, no, that's not true. And then somebody goes out and does this uh, research, and they find out that a GPU, on an average, is about nine times faster than a CPU to do graphical operations. So we realized that. And what we did with IE9 is all of the text graphic layout is essentially offloaded from the CPU all the way to the GPU. And the GPU obviously is, is incredibly fast for some of these things. So let me also share with you the machine that, on which I'm going to show you some of these demos. This is not an i5, it's not an i3 or an i7. It's an Intel Centrino V Pro. Right? So it's a, it's a dated machine. It's a three-year-old machine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go pick up a demo called Fish Tank. Now again, you'll have to explicitly remind yourself that this is a web application. This is an HTML5-based application. You can right-click view source, uh, and you'll obviously see 
you know JavaScript code, CSS code. Uh, it makes extensive use of HTML5 Canvas. Uh, again, it's HTML5 Canvas is two-dimensional. Uh, we've done some trickery called perspective to make this three-dimensional. So you can see the fish going small and big. Let's move along. Let's increase the number of fish. So I can go up to 100 fish, and you will notice the frame rate is still fairly well maintained. We can still show 100 fish at 60 frames per second, and it's not killing the CPU. Nothing is happening. Even at a thousand fish, the web experience is completely maintained. And if I were to full screen this, well, you will have to be told that this is not a screensaver. This is a web application. I, again, if you go up to uh, one of the Microsoft websites called windowsummit.com, you can actually see the source code, how this was built, you know, how did we enable fishes to bounce across walls, fish to become smaller and larger, all of those things. This is a web app, right? Now let's see how some of, you know, one of these kind of applications runs in another browser. So I'm going to go pull up Google Chrome. The good thing is because this is HTML5, the same application runs across browser. The difference is does it leverage all the native capabilities of the machine or does it not, right? And again, because we are optimized for Windows, we run very, very well on one operating system as compared to running mediocre well on all platforms. So here we have the same number of 20 fish. We are not at 60 frames per second, but it will jump in a minute. So let me go up to uh, 100 fish. Oops. You know how do you tell a dead fish? It doesn't move. <laughs> that's, that's kind of how you, you know, leverage the full power of the PC by building an application that uses not just the, GP, the CPU, but also the GPU and delivers what the user wants. Again, this is a, this is a fairly simple example. I'll show you another one. That's not a benchmark, what I just showed you, right? That's just a sample. So we put out another one, which we call the fishbowl benchmark. What this does is it tries to put out fishes as many as possible, as beautifully as possible uh, inside your, you know, uh, your, or 60 frames per second animation, right? And you can see we are, you know, clocking, we will taper off at about 440 odd fish, uh, and then that's kind of where it will stay. It's still climbing, okay, 350 now. And you know, running fairly smooth and fine. Uh, we can do other things like I can take off the shadow, I can take off the shine which is there on the bowl, I can take out the frame itself. So you can see the, the video is kind of occupying the entire screen. That's, that's kind of how this runs and this is a benchmark because what this tries, and do, tries to do is maximize the number of fish that's available inside, uh, inside the browser. How does the same thing fare in Chrome? You probably guessed it, right, if I'm showing you Chrome. I'm going to make this auto again. So nine fish, it'll climb, it'll climb, but it'll not be anywhere close to 350 fish. What you will notice is the, G, the CPU usage will obviously climb like crazy uh, in, the, in the Chrome demo. Again, trying to use the CPU for doing something that's graphically optimized, not going to work too well. So that's, those are you know, some of the demos. Uh, we've also got one of our partners, Snapdeal, uh, what they've done is they've essentially been able to offer local deals. So this is like deals that might be relevant for you uh, in your geography. So here's a quick list of all deals that are locally relevant, which is Bangalore for me, and shows them off in a, in a very quick interface. And as soon as I click and launch Snapdeal, you will notice the browser takes the look and feel of the website. So the back button is red and so on and so forth. So this is what we mean when we talk about native HTML5. Not just HTML5 code, syntax, tags, styles running inside a browser but running within the operating system, leveraging the full capabilities of the operating system. That's, that's what we're talking about when we talk about native HTML5. And also in terms of experiences that the users, can, that the developers can build. You're not limited to, oh, no, 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 you want to do that, please go native. We are not saying that. We are saying whatever Windows has to offer, all that and more is available to you inside a web application. So make your web app as powerful as you want it to be. The good thing, of course, is, uh, you know, we, we've, we've taken a very strong stand on supporting standards. Uh, and unlike IE6 or any of the previous versions, we are saying if it works in HTML5 standards mode, that's what we want you to do. We don't want any developer to sit and do this, if user agent equals MSIE6, da 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 da, if IE7 do this. How many of you love doing such code? <laughs> exactly, nobody does, right? So, so with HTML5, we are very, very committed to making sure that the same markup should work across browsers. And there are, there are tests and there are lots of validation mechanisms that the, world, uh, the W3C has put together. And we are contributing a bunch of tests to that to make sure that the same level of standard support is maintained uh, in IE9 as well. So in terms of themes, uh, if I have to you know, make a couple of them, 
uh, explicitly called out. We talk a lot about you know being able to build web applications that are competitive with native applications. Uh, we love talking about hardware acceleration. We talk about the fact that not all HTML5 uh, tags and syntax is today ready. A lot of HTML5 is actually work in progress. And, and as a developer, if you're starting to use HTML5, you should be aware of this. Some tags work in a browser, some tags don't work in, an, in another browser. Some of these tags will work today, tomorrow they may not work. That's a very important facet because today you, re, you rely on you know, a classic ex example like WebSockets. Yeah, it, it worked for some time and then it stopped working and now it doesn't work. And very soon it will start working again. So if you build a website that uses WebSockets, all the best, right? So native and yet cross-platform. And I just showed you the fish tank demo. It works across IE and Chrome. It just runs better on one as compared to the other. So a quick recap of what HTML5 is. If you haven't seen this, you should definitely get a copy of the slides. When somebody says HTML5, this is what they mean. They talk about everything that's there inside HTML5, the syntax, polyglot, markup, and so on and so forth. There's everything inside CSS3 that's part of HTML5, everything that's inside web apps that's part of HTML5. It's a, it's a fairly big body of spec. And it's not, you know, it's not a simple yes, no. Do you support this? Nobody can say yes or no. There's parts of this that's supported by a browser, parts of it that's not supported by a browser. So it's, it's important you familiarize yourself with what, you know, what HTML5 is and it's not. Uh, what we've done is we've built an, uh, a website called HTML5 Labs. All the standards that are still work in progress or all of those specifications that might become standards at some future point in time, uh, we put them all inside HTML5 Labs. WebSockets is one of them. Uh, so you feel free to you know, download them, use them, play with it, but it does not run inside the browser automatically. The browser has to explicitly be enabled through HTML5 uh, lab prototypes to support them. That's, that's our approach to IE9. So four weeks into IE9, uh, we said, you know, what are we going to do? We moved ahead and we put out uh, the next version of the browser. It's called IE10. Uh, and unlike IE9, it's not a full product yet. Uh, we've taken an approach of platform previews. So last week, we announced something called as Internet Explorer 10 Platform Preview 1. And again, uh, we are not putting out new version numbers unlike some of the other browsers. What we are more interested in is making progress. So from where IE9 left off, IE10 takes it further. So, so in my previous session, I was talking about IE9 supporting 95% of ECMAScript 262, which is a standard, uh, which is, by the way, higher than any other browser out there. But with IE10, we've got 200%. So not only is this a new version of the browser, a new platform preview, but it also moves the web forward. We have support, you know, we have support for additional things uh, inside IE10. I'll quickly show you one of them, uh, which is support for CSS uh, gradients, which is not included in IE9, and this is still, you know, work in progress. So what you can do with, you know, gradients is basically put out nice new gradients, right? Stuff that you would not have been able to do without using images, uh, you know, in, in HTML4 world. And that's something that's supported in IE10. And that's just one of the things. There are many, many, many more. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip them through. But fishbowl, I showed you the benchmark, how the graphics acceleration capabilities of IE9 just totally you know, enhance what your websites can do. Uh, I showed you CSS gradients. I didn't have time to go through multi-column layout. But I'm sure you know, most of you are wondering, saying, hey, IE9 just came out. I'm not even on IE9. And then there is this IE10 you know, surprise that Microsoft's dropped on the table. What should you do? So number one. If you're on Windows 7 or Windows, you know, Vista, get IE9, right? Uh, if you're on older versions of the operating system, realize it's a 10-year-old operating system. Uh, it's not supported, so maybe you should get onto a, a newer operating system like Windows 7 uh, and then get IE9. This is not a marketing message. I'm just being very candid with you, right? Uh, I'm assuming those of you who are running Windows XP are not running it on a 10-year-old machine. So if your machine is not 10-year-old, your operating system need not be 10-year-old. Uh, and therefore, your browser need not be IE6, uh, which, you know, we are more than happy to see the back off. Uh, in fact, there's a website called ie6countdown.com. Uh, it's something that we put out. And uh, it's very unfortunate that India kind of is one of the leading countries on IE6. There's still about 12.6% of the internet population in India that's on IE6. Uh, you know, we need your help. We absolutely need your help. There is sample code that Microsoft has put out. If you have a website, please put that code. And anybody who comes to the website through IE6 will be basically get a message. Hey, you're running an old browser, not safe, not secure. Please move to a new browser. You know, I'm happy to help you with the code. It's available on i6countdown.com. Uh, we want to see the back of that browser. So that's one. Uh, number two, if you're on Windows 7 or Windows Vista, get on IE9. If you're developing for HTML5, IE9 has great support for HTML5, uh, Canvas tag, you know, bunch of support for JavaScript, CSS, transitions, and so on and so forth. 
use that. Uh, if you're interested in experimental technology like WebSockets or IndexedDB, uh, I would encourage you to kind of play with that but not put it out in production because the spec is still changing. And if you still need you know, more bleeding edge, get on IE10 Platform Preview 1. Uh, in terms of websites, HTML5Labs is one, .com. Uh, you should also take a look at ietestdrive.com. Uh, you know, it's, it's got a bunch of demos. Uh, the best thing is they work across browsers. They work on IE9, they work on Chrome, they work on Firefox. They just highlight the differences of what the browsers are capable of and, and are not capable of. So with that, thank you so much. I hope you have a good conference.